welcome Roland Turner, Chief Privacy Officer at TrustSphere and Community Organizer with FOSS Asia. Hi, I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to introduce our final track before we break for lunch. We have two presentations today followed by a Q&A session. Uh, first up, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, the Vice President and CTO of IBM Asia Pacific, Prashant Pradhan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. So uh, the topic I'm going to be covering today is uh, about systems innovation. Yeah? And systems is a very broad term. So for the purposes of our discussion, we will use the term systems to represent you know, any tangible manifestation of technology, right? You know, computing systems, uh, telecommunication systems, uh, devices, uh, specialized systems such as AI, quantum, blockchain, and so forth. Yeah. So with that clarification, it's, it's clear that uh, you know, systems innovation has driven significant augmentation or enhancement, you can call it, in both our work as well as in life. And it's, uh, it's remarkably pervasive. If you, if you look at this picture, it's, it's sort of trying to represent some, some of that pervasiveness. If you consider any you know, average uh, day in the life right, for all of us, from the time you start your morning commute, when you're going to sort of one of the mass transit uh, uh, you know, uh, stations, uh, you, you, you're using these systems uh, you know, working behind the covers. When you, when you go do you know, whatever it is you do, whatever your profession is, there is probably not any, any profession left which is not augmented or enhanced uh, you know, by technology, by using complex systems. If you are, for example, an investment banker, chances are that your trading systems are actually running uh, you know, some pretty sophisticated uh, you know, uh, systems based on AI at the back. You know, the way your healthcare is driven, right? Uh, how you use technology or these systems for not just diagnostics, uh, not just things like imaging, but also increasingly decision support in healthcare is now augmented by, you know, these systems. Um, in, in your personal life, you know, if you're doing retail, any kind of commerce, the global supply chains that actually support all of that commerce, the entertainment that you do, right, with your family, or even personal mobility, right? I mean, uh, where we are actually seeing the advent of you know autonomous vehicles and so forth. All of this, all of this really is is being run by you know pretty sophisticated mission critical systems at the back. So if you sort of uh, uncover sort of what's behind each of those bubbles, right? You you basically see the diversity, the sheer diversity of the kinds of systems that are at play. So you know when when you're doing your little access card at your source and destination transit station those little events are actually going to probably some big mainframe computer at the back, which is processing and billing your card, right? And it's doing this for millions of transactions probably every hour. When you look at, as I said, you know, some of the specialized professions, you know, uh, these, uh, these interesting neural networks are, you know, becoming more and more pervasive in terms of how they are augmenting whatever it is you do, right? I mean, something as, you know, as specialized as, you know, the profession of, let's say, a Wall Street investment banker, all the way down to in teaching, right? Where actually AI is increasingly, uh, you know, supporting uh, the teaching profession in terms of how to do, you know, personalization and learning and so forth. In healthcare, obviously, right, a lot of advancements in specialized systems, genetics, CRISPR, etc. All of them are, you know, fairly sophisticated, complex systems. Your retail pervasively uses IoT. Your global supply chains, many of them increasingly are run on blockchain, right? And that's continue. That's something you will continue to see, uh, sort of, you know, uh, proliferating. Your, you know, your Netflix, all of those, you know, entertainment and streaming systems. You know, massive compute storage networking systems, increasingly with what you should watch also happening through, you know, intervened by some form of AI. And then, you know, in systems really on the edge, so the picture down there is, uh, you know, kind of an NVIDIA GPU that you can fit in the form factor of your car. And, and essentially, it is doing a lot of sophisticated inferencing work connected over 5G on the edge and actually supporting all of that, you know, autonomous mobility. So when you look at this picture, right, I mean, wh what's the sense that you get? One of the first sort of ideas that you get is that of complexity, right? It, it inherently seems that, okay, how could my, you know, the average day in the life 
be actually dependent on so many systems with so much complexity? Who understands all this stuff? And you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, engineers and scientists actually do not like complexity. People tend to think that you know we love complexity and talking about it. Actually, it makes us uncomfortable. We don't like it. It's it's brittle. Uh, it is difficult to control. And uh, you know, in in many cases, um, uh, you know, the, the the complexity basically means that it is difficult to continue innovating, because if all of this complexity was somehow coupled, right? You, you would actually have a lot of interdependencies in terms of you know continuing to do innovation. Fortunately, that is not the case. I mean, we we have you know frameworks in which we can really break down this complexity to something which is very understandable, very decoupled, right? And you know, uh, in 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 our profession, right? I mean, we uh, as IBM, for example, we we do a lot of work with our clients in many different industries. A lot of these are regulated industries, you know, mission critical work going on, and it's very very important for us that you know when we bring technology solutions to them, we are able to effectively manage this complexity. So what you see in this picture is you know how that how we break that up, right? I mean how that is layered. So the bottom layer is essentially where you know we are moving initially a lot of you know sort of computation capability at the core. And we are moving more and more of that to the edge, or even what is called the far edge, right? Which means very close to the radio network. So this layer is wrapped in sort, and you know, quantum is sort of the for some specialized computing task is sort of represents the le next level of uh, next frontier of innovation there. But essentially, there is a clean abstraction that you are able to put on it, right? And you see the cloud logo there. What what essentially it says that it abstracts that kind of computation, and fundamentally, the layers above only need to know that they have computing infinite capacity available anywhere in the network on demand right so that's the abstraction you want to wrap all of that cap that capability in and then you know the next layer it exposes sort of a clean interface to next is sort of the all important data layer where you know we started more with sort of a capacity and performance focus but we have now evolved to sort of more semantic richness so for example you know the data layer now encapsulates things like trust in massively distributed systems or so technologies like blockchain. Above that, of course, is the all-important sort of refinery, which takes all of this raw stuff and you know uh, converts that into insights. Right? That's essentially your AI layer, right? And all front-ended by digital engagement. Digital engagement essentially is multimodal. So all of this technology, all of this sophistication is ultimately available through a very simple sort of consumable interface, if you will, be it voice, be it text, uh, you know, be it video and so forth. This fundamentally allows us to empower the humans that are up top, right? So essentially what you see here, the way to break down the complexity is this decoupling, is the clean interfaces that have evolved between all of these capabilities that literally allows each layer to rapidly advance right on its own as its own pace and then you know the use cases for augmenting humans which is ultimately the goal here it basically you know evolves at a dramatic pace if you if you are a practitioner in ai for example you would know that you know the way people have built upon each other's work it has fundamentally led to sort of this dramatic explosion in innovation and new capabilities that have shown up in that world so essentially you know this gives us a framework to be able to manage that complexity and really you know um, really innovate at a breakneck pace right in, in all of these individual domains having said that right i mean this uh, th th this leads to another interesting point so these systems are evolving to mask complexity right you don't see you know all the all the detail behind right so obviously you know the way you consume technology today we have come a long way from how you know to use technology you had to use punch cards right in 1950s today it almost senses you know the need on its own if you're using some kind of a fitness app, it's probably telling you that you need your next drink of water even before you know it. Farmers in Africa are able to use AI and technology to decide you know, when to sow what kind of seeds, how to optimize you know, for irrigation and so forth. And you know, you're increasingly making things like financial decisions right, based on some kind of a robo-advisory that's telling you know, how to plan for your kid's college, how to actually save for your next holiday and so forth. Right? So this brings up an interesting question is masking complexity actually makes trust 
the next important frontier in systems innovation, right? Which is obvious. If you don't know what is going on, who is doing, you know, a lot of the decisions in your average day that you're doing, right? I mean, how, how do, can you actually trust these systems? And, you know, some of my colleagues earlier have spoken about this, and essentially this trust takes a lot of dimensions, right? How is my data being used, right? If you architect systems with privacy and data in mind, this is, you know, relatively simple problem. It's a problem of scale. The AI, uh, right, whether the decisions that AI is making on your behalf, are they explainable? Can you trust them? Are they bias-free? David spoke about some of that in his, uh, in his segment, and you know, we are actively at work on, in this area. The statistical techniques tend to have a little bit more of this problem as compared to more symbolic or interpretable techniques, right? So it's a hybrid, and we will get to a point where we are making these systems more and more explainable. And finally, you know, trust in digital ecosystems, right? Such as, you know, those that we, we uh, sort of do in blockchain. This is basically, these are different frontiers of where the need for trust evolves. So we basically moved from a you know, place where we were very pervasive, quite complex. You break down the layers of complexity, innovate on each separately, and then this brings up the issue of with easy usability comes the issue of trust. How do you actually attack that? So that's kind of how we try to, you know, model you know, this world of uh, systems innovation that's moving at breakneck pace and making sure that, you know, this is something that we can deal with. So my last chart, and this is a segue into, you know, my colleague uh, Cheryl's um, uh, sort of segment, which is where one of the important things that's getting recognized is that it's extremely important to do, to create open innovations ecosystems, right, for, for systems innovation. And the reason is quite simple, right? Firstly, it leads to, you know, much more, uh, you know, the pace of innovation is much faster when innovators all over the world are working, sharing information in an open ecosystem. It is more trusted, it is generally more robust because everybody is working on trying to make sure that it is safe, it's reliable. And ultimately, you know, we are getting to a point where open system innovation is actually leading to mission critical systems. It's no longer sort of, you know, the domain of a bunch of programmers working collaboratively among each other. But fundamentally, it's actually getting to a point where all of these, uh, you know, ju just for the sake of sustainability, all of these, you know, uh, uh, innovations in systems are ultimately going to be open yet mission critical, right? Which is actually a segue in, into, as I said, uh, you know, Cheryl's segment, who's uh, who's from the uh, you know Linux Foundation. She's director for ecosystems and uh, for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I'm going to invite her up on stage to sort of continue the theme on open innovation. Yeah, Cheryl. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cheryl Hung. I'm Director of Ecosystem at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Containers, Cloud Native, and Kubernetes are the building blocks of modern distributed systems. That's systems that are scalable, resilient, and observable. Today, I want to look at how Kubernetes has grown into the largest open source project today, or one of the largest how that's changing the expectations around open source, and what that means for companies. I started out as a software engineer at Google, building products and services on top of Google Maps. So I was writing C++ and deploying it using Borg. Borg later became open sourced as Kubernetes, and that's why I really believe that cloud native is the way forward, it solves actual problems that I see as an application developer. And my role at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is to bring that to other organizations. To introduce the foundation, so the foundation is a nonprofit. It's backed by all of the largest tech companies in the world today, including from China, we have Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. I have a few more logos for you to show you the companies that are involved. Fundamentally, the mission of the CNCF is to foster and sustain open source projects around cloud native. So the CNCF hosts more than 40 projects, of which the largest and most well known is Kubernetes. So I've been talking as if everybody knows what Kubernetes is so far. But if you haven't encountered it before, 
conceptually, it's actually very simple. Kubernetes is a classic control loop. So you give your specification about what you want. Kubernetes measures the actual state of your infrastructure, and then it makes changes to try and get closer to what you've specified. And it just goes round and round in that loop over and over again, always trying to get closer to what you've specified you want. That's it. That's Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is rare, if not unique, in the open source world in that it was defined very early on as both a project and a community. And there was a conscious effort to expand the group of people who could participate in that community. So I want to look at the journey that Kubernetes has taken since it joined the CNCF three years ago. So Kubernetes is made up of more than 1.1 million contributions on GitHub from more than 35,000 people across 2,000 different companies. And these companies are getting more diverse over time. So Google and Red Hat originally made up 85% of the contributions. But over time, as more and more companies have gotten involved, they now make up about 35%. These contributions are also geographically getting more diverse over time. And after the US, now the second highest number of contributors come from China. This graph shows the highest velocity open source projects across three axes. So the y-axis is the number of commits. Sorry, the x-axis is the number of commits, the y-axis is the number of pull requests and issues, and the size of the bubble reflects the number of authors. So Kubernetes is this pinkish circle in the top middle, and Linux is the purple circle to the top right of that. And also KubeCon, which is the Kubernetes conference, has grown over time, and this year, more than 23,000 people are expected to attend across US, Europe, and China. Most importantly, many big names, many well-known names, have successfully adopted cloud-native technologies. But at the same time, this success is setting new expectations. The first is that in cloud-native, Open source is the default. So one government agency told me, it used to be very hard for us to use open source. It would take us months to get through the appro approvals process. Now, anything underneath the CNCF is automatically approved, and it makes it very easy for us to adopt these new projects. And as a result, cloud containers and cloud native computing expertise is greatly in demand. So one consultancy last week asked me, we need to find 75,000 Kubernetes engineers. How can we find them? Well, I said, good luck, right? <laughs> That's maybe the worldwide group of experts who know Kubernetes. So one of the strategies that I see companies taking is being more open to engaging with open source communities. And this survey showed that the larger tech companies, in particular, are more likely to engage through an open source program or an open source initiative. And in fact, one financial services company told me, it's not an option for us not to do open source. If we don't take the lead on cloud native, we're going to fall behind our competitors. So, if you'd like to come on the next journey, several journey with us, please come join us either in San Diego or next year, Amsterdam or Shanghai. And I want to sum up by saying that this is not something that is a research project. It's not coming out of a university. It's not funded by grants. This is something that is happening right now. And I see and I've met 18, 19, 20-year-olds, students, who've never run software in anything other than a container. 
right? This is actually happening now. And I really believe that cloud native solves these actual problems that we all face in trying to run infrastructure. And the open source, great open source relies on great communities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. We'll open to the audience after a brief discussion, but I'd like to start with the, the same question uh, for both of you. Uh, where do you foresee the open innovation philosophy having the greatest impact? Well, so um, as I alluded to in my, uh, in my conversation earlier, um, surprisingly, we, we're actually seeing the greatest impact in the next generation of mission critical systems, right? And this is something across the board, across the industry, whether it's financial services, whether it is in, you know, uh, retail, and any other industry you can think of. We, we're actually seeing that, and, and you know, if you, in retrospect, if you think about it, it's kind of natural, right? I mean, uh, if you are building a, uh, you know, if you ha have an ambitious architectural plan to build a building, you wouldn't rely on components that actually are highly proprietary or you know not open. Yeah, we we used to. Yeah. We used to, and uh, you you know it's increasingly understood that you know for safer, more robust, you know more open systems that are transparent, and of course things that will benefit the maximum from the pace of innovation, you need to build on open, right? So that's something that we we're really seeing that you know more and more of mission critical systems are now being designed to be built on on open. So, and, and the, the other dimension, and, and again, as I said, I mean, I reflected some of that diversity in one of my opening charts. We, we're actually seeing that open is now, you know, straddling sort of all of those layers, if you will. So as some of you may be familiar, uh, the networks of the telecommunication companies, they are actually now moving to open source, right? right? So essentially what is called network function virtualization or NFV, that's basically taking open, you know, deep in the core of the network. Well, if, even for the 5G standards, there are yeah, reference so implementations that are open for many of them. Yeah, correct. So if you, if you see a, a lot of the 5G code, open RAN and, you know, these kinds of initiatives, they are all basically, uh, you know, in the coming from the open community. And, you know, everybody sees the benefit that it really allies, uh, allows them to ride on top of the innovation that's happening on all of these areas. And, of course, you know, newer areas such as... Um, you know, uh, quantum AI, etc. Clearly, all the innovation is happening on you know open tech. Th there is almost nothing proprietary. If you look at, for example, AI research, people do great work. They put the code out there, and people just you know keep building exponentially on top of that. So you know, it's uh, it's just a trend that I think is never going to reverse, and that's it's going to be more and more. You will see that in mission critical systems. Yeah. So this is also the inverse of your one of your points about pace. That in fact, it's not. It's flipped, it's now reversed, not that open source put barriers in the way, but rather it now means that you can innovate much, much faster that than you could with, yeah. with closed components. Same, same broad question to you. Uh, where do you foresee mm. the open philosophy having uh, its greatest impact? So as I mentioned, at least where I work, which is cloud native, open source is the default, right? It's not an option that you can pick or choose. And similarly to what what you said, the ability for these communities to work together outside of, an, outside of their own organizations means that the pace is moving faster and faster and faster. And Kubernetes is, uh, unlike some of the other topics that have been discussed this morning, Kubernetes is not something that is happening sort of five years ahead or 20 years ahead or 50 years ahead, right? It's the past 15 years worth of DevOps best practices wrapped up into a single tool as built by Google and Red Hat and so many others, right? Open source has enabled that beyond anything that we've seen in other areas. There's a fascinating shift in how technology is developing. Um, naturally, I have other questions prepared, but let me open to the audience. Are there any questions? Oh, there's one down here. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, insightful session. Uh, my name is Varun, and I'm from Asia School of Business. Uh, you mentioned about blockchain, right? Like it replacing the trust and all the factors. And in one of the previous session, it was told that quantum uh, computing would be a, like public cryptography will be a direct threat to uh, uh, the quantum computing. So, and blockchain, the heart of blockchain is public key cryptography. So, while blockchain itself is getting evolved, 
how does blockchain uh, take into effect of uh, quantum computing? Right, so I think, see, that impact, of course, is not limited to blockchain. Any kind of system, uh, right, uh, just pervasive encryption in your, you know, even your SSL, right, normal web transactions that you do, credit transactions, both for systems in motion and at rest, that's going to be in threat. So I would say, you know, it's not, the challenge was, you know, called out in earlier sessions. And, of course, there's going to be continued innovation on things like, can we actually do, uh, once we, it, not just sort of break, classical encryption, but, you know, come up with in quantum domain, you know, mechanisms of encryption that are then hard in the quantum domain. So I think, you know, j just like any other thing, we have to just see, you know, the pace of innovation in all of those areas. There are, you know, innovations such as, you know, things like homomorphic encryption, they were coming out to basically see if we can operate on data purely in the domain of encryption without sort of decrypting, right? So then we, we, we're now faced with a different problem that, you know, encryption itself, right? It's, it's viability is getting challenged. So, so I actually think, uh, of course, we don't have that answer yet. But, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is that blockchain just happens to be, you know, one of the many sort of trust systems that actually leverage encryption. So uh, the challenge that we have in terms of addressing you know, when, when quantum becomes viable uh, is actually uh, across all of those domains. And, you know, that's essentially what the community is working on yeah, to figure out. Uh, Paul Gagnon, uh, going on to the question of uh, encryption and security and open source. It was raised about uh, a year ago at a conference I went to where one of the developers of open source uh, Linux talked about the fact that when they originally de designed it, they didn't have the idea that there would be any malevolent intent surrounding the, the writing of the code. And ironically, five or 10 years later, the, the hackers were going back and because they had access to the open source, were able to take that code and, and, and shift it in ways that were not intended. How do you see the community managing that in terms of, uh, the development of security uh, going forward, offensively and defensively. So within the context of Kubernetes, which I know the most about, the foundation that I work for, CNCF, actively invests into security audits for the project. And it's a requirement for, in fact, all of the projects. So you're absolutely right that security is not uh, something you can necessarily leave to the community that will resolve itself. So we make a very active choice to work on that from a, from a, a, a proactive um, perspective. And I, I think to add to that, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a misconception that, you know, if we can see the code, right, it, it becomes easier to break. What really happens is that, you know, security is a function of, you know, uh, many things, right? Not just, for example, the code, how you're handling access management, how, for example, you're doing things like trust. So, so I think it, it's not so much that, you know, if it's transparent how the system is built, the principles that are designed, you know, mathematically or otherwise to actually protect communication or, you know, uh, specification-based declarative systems, right, that actually enforce certain invariants, right, on how the program works. Th those are fundamentally the drivers of what brings security. It's security doesn't happen because, you know, somebody can't see my source code, yeah? So, so I think uh, most of the security practitioners that you speak to, you will actually see that a lot of the vulnerabilities, yes, some of them could be because of bad code, but ultimately, you know, holistically treating system design for security is really the answer. So this particular issue, of you know being transparent, the code being open is not necessarily the challenge that we have, right? It is things like if you have mathematical abstractions that no longer allow you know a particular approach to be secure. Yeah, is, is there not also at least an argument in, in the reverse direction that open communities, uh, once their vulnerabilities are discovered, yeah. have a really compelling interest the, in getting the thing closed fast, whereas closed source vendors might sit on it for a release cycle or two or three or four. That's correct. That's a great point, actually. You know, um, th th there are a lot of smart, good people also. <laughs> so open source allows you to fix stuff, right, much faster 
than you would do in let's say a proprietary you know one company control technology so actually the the frontier for you know who's actually trying to fix it the good guys right it, it's it's equally stronger right in the in because of open source so i i don't think that it's one or the other, right? There are some great closed source companies who will fix things quickly and some great open source projects that would fix it quickly and some that will never fix on either side, yeah. right? You might have a leaning more one way or the other, but I don't think it's clear that one is always better than the other. That's certainly my, my guess. I think we're squeezing just one more. Hi, my name is Shazad from the MetLife Innovation Center. Uh, the question is for Prashant, really. Um, when you mention increasing complexity in systems, does this um, necessarily include increasing the risks that um, the entire cyber stack has? Thanks. Yeah, so uh, it does. And, and sort of there are different dimensions to it. One is that, you know, complex systems that you do not understand or cannot manage well are fundamentally brittle, right? So the risk is, you know, purely in terms of, you know, if these are critical systems and we don't understand the complexity or can control the complexity, there's a problem, right? The other source of risk, as I sh explained, flows in a slightly interesting way. Because they're complex, you want to make them extremely simple to consume, right? It's very intuitive. But when the more control you give up to decision support, et cetera, to these systems, the issue of trust comes back. So sort of two, two frontiers of that risk, right, from complexity. One is complexity engenders attempts to simplify and then abstract more and more away from the user. So that's a trust issue. And of course, in, in terms of not being able to understand or manage that complexity, that's, uh, that's sort of the second issue. So, I mean, for example, w one of the interesting frontiers of the, all this complexity and so forth, autonomous driving, there were a couple of questions asked, right? So I, I have a nano degree in autonomous driving, right? So I studied the subject. The more you know, the, the more you understand sort of the deep innovations in there, right? The better is your ability to manage and control that risk. So I, I actually think it's a, it's a matter of subject matter expertise depth, right? No matter how complex these systems sound, ultimately there is a way to get both simplicity as well as uh, you know, trust in those systems, yeah? All right, I think we, yeah, we should probably call it there. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Prashant Thank you.